Tonight, Heartbleed, the bug that keeps on bleeding, Amazon's smartphone, and Dropbox stands by Condoleezza Rice. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 64 for Friday, April 11th, 2014. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. I'm Jason Howell, and tonight... We're going to get started right off the bat by talking to Eric Limer, who's the associate editor for Gizmodo. Thank you so much for joining me today, Eric. Thanks for having me, Jason. Absolutely. Uh, this has undoubtedly been the week of Heartbleed, which for those of you who have not heard about it yet, let's just say it's about time you listen up. Uh, Eric, you've written several articles on Heartbleed. Your latest was How Heartbleed Works, the code behind the Internet's security nightmare. So let's start right there. What is at the root of this bug and who should be concerned about it? So really, when it comes down to what Heartbeat actually is, it's an extremely simple coding error. Uh, anybody who's ever written a piece of code would probably be familiar with the kind of mistake of just not checking the length of a certain string and then and things get bad from there. So it's basically just that when two servers go and talk to each other, they, they send uh, data back and forth, uh, which is called a heartbeat. And the problem with heart bleed is if a malicious person figures out the right way to lie about the kind of data that they're sending as a heartbeat, they can get access to the server's memory buffer, which has all kinds of good data as long as you, you know, keep doing it enough until you start finding good stuff like, like passwords and usernames and credit card numbers and like site encryption keys if you get lucky enough. Yeah, I know. And the, and the memory allocations is a very small amount. It's 64K, but the more you do it, it's all sequential with that information that you get back. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, yeah, you can, and you can submit zero data. So yeah, you can get it in <laughs> 64 uh, kilobit chunks. Wow, that's so, crazy. All right, yeah. so so that's kind of what's behind Heartbleed. Um, you know, we've heard all week that users need to change their passwords on affected sites, but only once those sites have made changes on their end to address the problem. Now, personally, I've been a little appalled at how few sites and services have actually reached out by email to educate me, educate users about the vulnerability, or even just let them know that their service was affected and what users can do to protect themselves uh, in light of it. What has your assessment been as to the response of major services and websites to Heartbleed? Yeah, it hasn't really been that great. I mean, I can remember a lot smaller security breaches where I've gotten, you know, when you go to log on, they're like, oh, we had a problem, you need to change your password. I'm not. Um, I think part of the reasoning behind it, at least with some of the larger sites, is that this was a problem, you know, this bug has been in the wild for, for I think, about two years. But uh, a lot of larger sites like Google and Facebook were affected by it, but they managed to, uh, you know, update and patch before the news came out. So they were never affected by it while everybody knew that it was an issue. So yeah. I can kind of see how maybe they could think that they could get away with not really having to say anything about it because it's not a problem anymore. But, but still, like, it, it, it should be... Whenever your user has any reason to change their password, you know, that's definitely something that it pays to be upfront about. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for our vis our viewers and listeners, what are a few, you know, you mentioned Google and Facebook. What are a few of those mm -hmm. other major sites that have actually given the all clear for folks like you and I to go in and, and change our passwords right now? There's no more waiting. Yeah, uh, so Google and Facebook are probably two of the biggest ones that uh, they were fixed up before news about Heartbleed broke. Uh, I think Yahoo was probably the most uh, prominent site that still had the, uh, the bad SSL when the news broke and things right. were like a free-for-all for 24 hours there. Mm -hmm. But they're good. You can reset your passwords for there. Um, I think uh, Dropbox and uh, yeah. and there are a couple more. There, uh, We have a list on Gizmodo. There's a couple of other uh, lists hanging out, out there. So it's definitely something worth, worth Googling. And if you use LastPass, they're actually uh, notifying their users um, which LastPass passwords they should change, which is a really, 
really handy thing to do to kind of make up for the sites that aren't coming out and saying it directly. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because now in light of all of this, it just kind of points out even more just how important or how valuable having a password manager like that is. So you don't have the same password on a million different services. You can just let something like La yep. LastPass manage it for you. And they've done a, they've done a great job notifying their users and uh, being really open as far as what they can do to he uh, help themselves. Um, well, the problem doesn't just affect the web, of course. Google said in a blog post on Wednesday that Android was clear with one exception. That's version 4.1. Point one, Jelly Bean, uh, which has the bug. Uh, Google has patched the issue in the versions of Android that followed, but that means that carriers and manufacturers are on the hook to implement Google's fix on those afflicted devices that are still out there. How many of these devices are there uh, still kind of wandering the earth with this bug uh, vulnerability? And when can those users expect to see a fix? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to tell because Google isn't, they don't share data that's that granular. So there's a number floating around that I think uh, about 35% of Android devices out there are on 4.1.x, which is, that's kind of alarming. That's a lot of devices. Yeah, it is. But unfortunately, 4.1.1 uh, is, is kind of dead in the middle right there. It's 4.0, which had a whole bunch of features. And uh, the update to 4.1.1 was just a tiny update uh, specific to the Nexus 7. And it was followed up pretty soon after that by 4.1.2. So if there had to be a version, a like relatively recent version of Android that was affected, uh, 4.1.1 probably seems like one that has probably been paved over and, and may have been one that people uh, skipped in the first place. So hopefully there aren't that many out there. Um, Lookout has an app that you can get on the, the uh, Google Play Store that'll let you know if your device is affected and, and you should definitely check that out. And if it is effective, just try not to do anything too sensitive on your phone sure. for a while until Google gives the all clear. Sure, sure. Okay. Now, the NSA doesn't have a lot of trust points these days, thanks to the never-ending trove of Edward Snowden leaks. So when Bloomberg reported earlier today that the NSA has been exploiting the Heartbleed bug and gathering intelligence from it for at least two years, it was pretty easy to believe. Not three hours later, the NSA took to Twitter to assert that they weren't aware of the vulnerability until it was made public days ago. Uh, would you say this is a no-win situation for the NSA? Uh, how believable is their claim, would you say? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a no win. Um, I don't really believe it at all. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, right? Because like three, yeah. three hours is a pretty long time to come up with a tweet and like, no, oh, no. Oh. But uh, yeah, I mean, really, what else could they say? You know, uh, uh, that they certainly aren't going to admit that they knew about it and they can't just say nothing. Sure. So it's really, this is about all they could do. Yeah. And it's also not entirely surprising. Um, I, I saw some numbers somewhere that, you know, open SSL's budget is is about, you know, a million dollars a year, whereas the the NSA has over a billion dollars like devoted to trying to find exploits like this. And if you're a malicious, you know, person who finds an exploit like this and like uses it for a little while and and then maybe you decide that you don't want to get caught or go to prison or whatever, you can always just you know, go to the NSA and you know, you know, flip over for your handout. So uh, sure. it's not surprising that they would know about it. No, absolutely, absolutely. And finally, it's obviously it's a complex issue here. How about hackers? Are there any reports that indicate that hackers are actively exploiting this bug right now? How would we even know about that about it if that access was happening behind the scenes, or would we? Well, one of the scariest things about uh, Heartbleed is just by the nature of the bug, it's pretty much impossible to know if yeah. it was ever exploited, which is why all these all these sites that ever you know had the bug you just have to if you want to be safe you just have to assume that somebody out there knows your password mm -hmm. so it's it's really it's also impossible to know how widespread knowledge of this bug was before like news of it broke yeah. but uh there's definitely when the when news did break and it was before everybody got a chance to uh to upgrade their to uh upgrade their ssl so there was that like 24 hour period there where, I mean, you just have to imagine that anybody who could figure out how it was doing it, yeah. how to do it was, was trying it. I mean, I, I definitely saw people who weren't malicious and just being like, yeah, I tried this to see if it worked. And I, it's scary. I got it this works. chunk of usernames and yeah. it's like, oh man, uh, you can think of all the script kitties out there who are just, you know, absolutely well to be like, oh, we better get this before Yahoo patches it. Yeah. So. Sleep, sleep tomorrow, hack tonight. Yeah. yeah exactly. uh, well, it's obviously an incredibly complex and messy situation, uh, but I want to thank you for bringing some clarity to it today, Eric. You were a big help for, I'm sure, a lot of uh, the viewers and listeners on the show. So thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Where can people uh, follow your work and find you online? Oh, you can find my work at gizmodo.com and uh, my 
best place to follow me online is just uh, on Twitter, uh, at Eric Limer. Right on, Eric. Thank you again. Take care and have a great weekend. Yep, too. All right, we'll get to the tech feed in a second, but before then, I want to take some time to thank the sponsor of today's episode, and that would be lynda.com. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. With, with lynda.com's easy-to-follow video tutorials, you can learn at your own pace, on your own terms, from industry experts. With a lynda.com subscription, members get unlimited access to thousands of online video courses covering a wide range of technical skills, creative techniques, and business strategies. Want to improve your photography? master new software, boost your web design skills, learn programming. At lynda.com, you'll find top quality videos on hundreds of different subjects. You can watch from your computer, tablet, your mobile device. The instructors are accomplished professionals. They're experts in the field who are passionate about teaching. And each course is structured so you can learn from start to finish or just jump to find a quick answer on something. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library or for $37.50 a month, you can uh, subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial, free. Visit lynda.com slash TN2 to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses for free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash TN2. All right, and now the tech feed. Amazon is announcing their very own smartphone. According to the Wall Street Journal, the company will make the announcement by June and ship by September. Amazon has been reportedly demonstrating versions of the handset to developers in San Francisco and Seattle. The journal states that the device will be capable of displaying 3D content without wearing glasses. The smartphone may also have retina tracking technology embedded in the four front-facing cameras, which would make some images appear like a hologram. Sounds a little like science fiction to me, but we'll have to wait and see how this shakes out. Online protests followed immediately after Dropbox announced the appointment of former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to its board. Uh, today, the company released a statement on their blog. Here it is, quote, There's nothing more important to us than keeping your stuff safe and secure. It's why we've been fighting for transparency and government surveillance reform. We should have been clearer that none of this is going to change with Dr. Rice's appointment to our board. Our commitment to your rights and your privacy is at the heart of every decision we make, and this will continue, end quote. The Post went on to say that having Miss Rice on board will help as the company expands internationally. Need something 3D printed? Head over to Staples. Well, that's the idea that the company is exploring in two of their stores in New York and Los Angeles. Customers without any 3D printing expertise can walk in, and someone on staff will walk them through the project. The stores will also feature a photo booth where customers can take 3D pictures of themselves. Almost a year ago, the company announced it would be the first major retailer to sell 3D printers. And finally, uh, you can do that. So <laughs> check it out. Uh, and last but not least, want to take 3D printing into your own hands? Say hello to the Micro 3D Printer. This is a low-cost 3D printer that's aimed directly at the mainstream consumer. And M3D, the makers of the Micro, are obviously doing something right. They took a, to Kickstarter four days ago with a goal of $50,000 to aid in the release of its prototype to market, met that goal in 11 minutes, passed $1 million in 25 hours, and currently sits at $2.3 uh, million dollars from more than 8,300 backers and 25 days left to go. Talk about going from zero to hero. If you are interested in getting in on the action, there are a number of uh, units, a limited number of units left to claim, and you can expect to drop around $299 to start. But don't get all whiny if Facebook comes along and decides to buy them in a year, okay? That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program. That's Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Jason Howell. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.